All right, good evening. Nothing's changed, still me. So, um, Connor apparently has tested positive for the second time. I don't know if that's is that what that is, but yeah. He uh, sent her a picture. With, uh, he tested positive for the second time. So in like 10 weeks, Connor. That's why he's not here. So uh, anyway, so there you go. Yeah. So anyway, that's why he's not here. Here we go again. So anyway, he said his, he said he wasn't feeling that bad, but uh, but uh, anyway. <coughs> so that's just, yeah. So we'll have fun. I don't know. They're, they're associating that with certain behaviour. <laughs> it's not just well, it's swinging, but not in trees. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, all right. Uh, we uh, because I haven't picked any songs. Uh, I'm waiting for you guys to pick songs tonight. So we're gonna pick a couple. Sorry. Is, yeah. What number is that? Three nine six. Is that two lords? No. Is it? 396, he's on it. He's open it. Yeah, alright, 396. Our, uh, our goal tonight, there's only one goal, and that's to pick a song that the piano player can't play. No, no she, was, she just had that. No, she, she was, uh, we just had a conversation before. Uh, she loves these nights. <laughs> Tests her repertoire. No, she does very good. Uh, alright, do Lord, oh do Lord. 396, 396.
everything this is morning? Oh no, living by faith. Living by faith. Five hundred and forty-seven. The first and the last of five hundred and forty-seven. I cannot today what tomorrow may bring if shadow or sunshine or songs that uh, talented musicians have written in uh, great honour to your name. I pray you'd uh, bless our time as we sing these great songs this evening and the word of God as well. And just bless the people that uh, gathered here tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> uh, just a couple of announcements before I take the next uh, uh, request. Um, the 19th is a Chili Con Khan uh, cook-off or whatever, but um, that'll be at 6 o'clock on that particular evening. And then um, Josh will be with us uh, on the Sunday. We'll be preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night of the 21st. And looking forward to him and the family being up with us. So, And then we'll do a luncheon afterwards as well. If anyone, uh, you know, we'll just uh, bring a potluck, bring something to share. Something for your family and something for enough for someone else as well. And if everybody does that, we'll have a bit of everything. So just, just bring uh, something along to, to feed you and someone else. <coughs> Uh, we'll share it all around. Uh, on that particular lunch, there's a um, ladies' uh, coffee this week as well, 10 o'clock. Uh, what did I read out this morning? What is it? Glen Forest. Glen Forest. What's the name of the place? Glen Forest Gourmet. Glen Forest Gourmet. Uh, they're at 10 o'clock uh, for a ladies' coffee uh, on Saturday for those wishing to go along for that. Um, Songs. Let's see. I'll hand it. To you. I'll start with the ladies first. Four thirty-five. Four hundred and thirty-five. Four hundred and thirty-five. When the roll is cold up yonder. Yeah. When the trumpet. Shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright of fame. And the sailors shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up.
four one three. We'll take this as our blessing song um, this evening. Four one three. Sober in the glory land. Let's sing the first and the second. Take some blessings, and uh, then we'll we'll do verses three and four as well. We'll sing this oldest song. It's a good one. Uh, so we'll take blessings after the second verse. Francisco, uh, one time uh, we went and did the Alcatraz tour, and uh, when you go do the Alcatraz tour and we went over to the Rock, and uh, they have all well at least when I was there they had uh, self guided tours, and you put in your uh, little headphones and um, and you had a Walkman or something back in whenever I went I was like seventeen when I went and did it, and uh, and you go around and they and uh, you hear the on the audio you hear the clanging of the of the cells and footprints and the voices talking and telling you stories about different inmates that were in the in the prison and I just remember one the thing that stood out to me the most <coughs> was uh, it one section of it uh, as you go around and you can get a view back over the shore to um, back to San Francisco and uh, it was Oakland or San Francisco one of the way I can't remember which way we we're looking but um, the voice of the prisoner was saying to one of the worst things being locked up here in, in the rock is uh, he said it comes on uh, New Year's Eve and things like that. He says because you hear the you hear the sounds of the joy and you hear the sounds of the laughter. Sometimes the wind is blowing in the right direction and you hear the fireworks going off and you can just hear everyone having a good old time. And here you are locked up in your cell. And he says you could actually hear and you could see the glow of the fireworks and things like that off in the sky. And when I think of this song, I think you know what every now and again. Uh, just through church and being around the saints, it's like you can just sort of you can just sort of sense the wafting of the joy coming across the bay from where we're going. <laughs> we're uh, we're going to glory land, and uh, I think sometimes you get you get uh, God just allows sometimes the breezes to blow from the celestial city into our hearts and into our lives, and it's sort of realised that we're not we might be locked up or we might think that we're in prison here, but we get we get to go there and uh, just over in the glory land. Uh, I love it. Uh, uh, blessings tonight. We got a blessing. Blue. Yeah, my wife's blessing. Um, when I was sick, I was in the rest of the hospital to the room with the person that uh, was her frame in the aged care. <laughs> yeah. And, um, her hourly rates aren't too bad, I heard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll negotiate now. She is a teacher, so. I'll <laughs> Very good. Yeah, good. Any other blessings tonight?
Josh. Pray for Rob Ellis' uh, younger brother. Yeah. Uh, any other uh, blessings? Yeah, just just the blessing that Judith and all his soup and his bread and uh, yeah. it's a real blessing. Yeah. Yeah, no, that soup is good. Very good on Linda Bag Shaw. Let's sing uh, a third and the fourth here. <coughs> We had uh, sold a caravan today, which was a massive blessing. Uh, it, we had problems with it. It was uh, uh, Josh and I and Rhiannon and Lisa have a term called a dog bed, but it's just a bit, it was a bit of a dog bed caravan. It just didn't work well for us. And um, anyway, uh, when the heavy rains came, like last week, the number one problem with a caravan is you don't want it to leak. Yep. Uh, and this was leaking, and I was like, oh man, I had so much interest in this caravan, and then we're like, oh no, it's leaking, I was like, no, and I, and I just got it back from the shop, and anyway, anyway, a bit of a problem, anyway, I thought it was fixed, and uh, someone said they'll come in today, and um, anyway, they contacted me about 12.30 after lunch, I said I wouldn't be home till one, and they were going to come, and I said, I said, look, and I went in to un unlock it, and what I thought had been fixed, it was leaking again, and uh, I just remember my dad saying when he had business, when he was had his own business, he always just said, he says, as hard as it may be, just tell people the truth. And it, it saves a ton of problems if you just be upfront and tell them the truth about whatever the situation is. Um, and so I, when I opened it up, went to turn it on, I turned the lights on, I just texted them back and said, look, I'm really sorry. I said, I know you come from Rockingham. I said, I've just opened it up and it's still leaking out of the vent. Um, and I said, I just didn't want you to come all that way and find out when you got here. Um, and anyway, I just got a thumbs up back. I was like, I don't know if that means like, okay, whatever. Anyway, they came and they looked at it and, uh, I, and he looked at it and said, where, where was that leak again? I was like, oh, just around here. He's like, oh yeah, no, that's fine. We can fix that. That's no problems yet. And I said, this issue over here as well. He's like, nah, it's all right. No issue at all. Man, they gave us just uh, a really good deal on it and they took it off our hands and like every problem they knew about and they took it and it was just it was a blessing to Rihanna and I today uh, for them to do that so that was good any other any other blessings does have problems in his body, man, he's, he's, the amount of times he comes to church and he said, oh, I had some rust cut out this week, and he's honestly, he's in the triple digits on surgeries, like he's in the hundreds, literally, like 120 or 30 or something like that, different surgeries he's had, 
Uh, yeah, that is. Uh, it, Rob sort of comes in and goes, and people you have to go to catch him real quick on a Sunday morning. But uh, man, he's a good man. He's a, a man of faith. He loves the Lord, and uh, he's he's always praying for people, and and uh, really good guy. But uh, yeah. Uh, any any last prayer requests before we take up our offering this evening? Uh, what did I say? Prayer requests. Did I say prayer requests? Sorry, I'm, that's my track. That's what I say. Yeah, when I'm asking for stuff, it's prayer requests. Sorry. Yeah. Anyone have any comments over any of the other songs we sang? Any <laughs> questions, feedback? So you know. All right. No. All right. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you again for your goodness to us and the money that we get to take up tonight. And, and you are good to us, Father. Truly, you are, you've blessed us abundantly. And we want to acknowledge that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, Father. You are a good God to us. And you are, and uh, as, as um, sometimes we look at it and think that we're hard done by, but God, we're truly, we're not. You're good to us. Thank you for it. May you bless the money tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to do two more songs as our last one. So uh, two more songs we want to pick. Uh, Gemma, 446, Heaven's a pretty popular theme tonight. I think that's it. Oh, I, mean, I, mean, I thought it was in the 414s. 446. All right, why don't we go ahead and sound these last two. Why don't stretch our legs before uh, the uh, couple of hours of preaching ahead of us. Check out what we've got. 446, we'll sing the first and the last, and then we'll take one more after this.
47. First Samuel, second Samuel, second Samuel chapter number 11. <clears throat> I don't know really uh, how I ended up here in second Samuel tonight, um, but uh, just sort of traced, a, tracked a few things, traced a few, th uh, ended up here anyway. Second um, Samuel chapter number 11, very famous story, very famous story in the Old Testament um, that we will read um, tonight. Uh, just an aspect of it. We um, this is how this is how the the steps and the pieces were put together. Uh, Friday night we went down to Rockingham, and uh, the preacher there preached out of uh, Luke and the Good Samaritan, and uh, about showing mercy and having mercy. And I just was sort of started me on a journey here a little bit and traced a few different things, um, and then got thinking about this story, which is sort of the opposite of mercy, and you'll see it in a minute what I mean by that. Um, but 2 Samuel chapter number 11, verse number 1 says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabah. Uh, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Stop, look up here for a second. All right, you know the rest of the story. Um, where was Bathsheba? Okay. Yes. Yes. I only say that because almost everybody says uh, that Bathsheba was taking a bath on the roof. She wasn't taking a bath on the roof, folks. She, she wasn't, all right? And I only say that because I've said the same thing stuff before. Uh, terrible place to take a bath. But re read this. She's not. Julie's absolutely right. <laughs> she, he, what, look, verse number two. And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed. He arose off his bed in the evening. The guy is just like lounging around all day, it would seem. He should have been off going off to war. should have been going off doing kingly things. And it came to pass in the evening that David rose off his bed. Um, and, he and he walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. She, she's not on the roof, folks. Um, if in that particular part of um, Jerusalem as well, where the old city is, the city of David, um, it's on a very steep, it's on that steep incline that goes down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which then leads up to um, the Mount of Olives on the other side. But uh, where David's palace was and he, where his house was and the city laid out below him, it was terraced. 
So he's on his roof, he's looking down into people's houses, unbeknown to um, them. She's, she's there thinking she's in private, but from the king, from his lofty perch, spies her. Um, and from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messages and took her. And she came in unto him. And he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Uh, we'll leave, we'll go through this as we, as we read through it. But uh, it's, it's, such a, it's such a strong story. It's such a striking story. Um, it's also a watershed moment in the life of David. It's like, it's the watershed moment the, where, where the water goes in either one direction at the peak and his life goes in a different direction and it can be traced from this very night that uh, he is there or this particular time in his life where he is just being idle. He's doing nothing. He's just sitting back doing where he should have been doing things. He wasn't doing anything. We mentioned Sodom, uh, the city of Sodom, and as much as people want to say the sin is the sin of uh, sodomy, um, and homosexuality. But if you were to read Isaiah or Ezekiel, I think it's Ezekiel maybe, where it says that the sin of Sodom, uh, which was pride and uh, fullness of bread and abundance of idleness, they were the sins of the city of Sodom, that they were proud and they were also had plenty of bread, lots of food, lots of sustenance, lots of uh, provisions. Life was easy and there was an abundance of idleness. They didn't have to go work hard every day. There was, they had time on their hands and they used that time on their hands to end up doing things that they ought not have been doing. And they enacted upon their lusts. Uh, what ultimately brought the judgment of God. Um, and it has been well said by many preachers over the years, and now this preacher also, that idleness is the devil's playground. Do nothing and the devil gets in and you will end up doing things that you ought not be doing because idleness is the devil's playground. Be busy. Be busy about serving God. Be busy in life. You want to conquer sin? Then go do stuff. Go be busy in your life. Go be proactive. Um, and here is David, who normally was proactive as a man, but in this season of his life, didn't do what he should have been doing, was sitting around all day doing nothing, and then, uh, sp then spied Bathsheba. And one thing led to another, where he goes and calls her, and, uh, and she comes to the palace, she comes to his house, and uh, an affair takes place. An affair is such a terrible word as I came out of my mouth. I just wanted to retract them as soon as they passed my lips. An affair is like, people say, oh, he's had an affair. That's just like watering down. No, the man committed adultery. He sinned against God. And sometimes we just to toss out these words. One author that I was reading one time, he says, we like to lessen, man has a way of wanting to lessen sin's treachery by using euphemistic phrases. Just like changing, euphemistic, a euphemism, changing what the actual word is to something of lesser or of a different type. And we often will lessen sin's treachery by using euphemistic phrases. It's not an affair. Um, it's, uh, it's adultery is what he had, and he committed adultery here. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Verse 6 says, And David sent to Joab, And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. Now Uriah is one of the uh, one of the mighty men of David. He's a he's one of his his key men. Um, and David had that group of men that were his mighty men and were close to him. And uh, they were mighty and valiant men. And Uriah was one of those. And David uh, calls him and sends to Joab and uh, says, "Send me Uriah the Hittite." And Joab sent Uriah to David, verse 7. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did and how the people did and how he, the war prospered. And it, just by that word demanded, it doesn't seem like he just asked, but there was like sort of a, a sternness in David's voice towards Joab. And he says, tell me how things are going. Tell me how Joab's doing, how the men doing, how's the war going. 
And Uriah's like thinking, man, I'm not a messenger. Like, that's not normally what I am. I'm normally one of the key soldiers. I'm one of the key men. And he says it's probably a bit strange. He's probably thinking it's a bit strange for him to be there before David as a messenger. Um, and he just explains the war and explains how the battle's going there against uh, uh, Rabbah, Rabah. And uh, he says those things. And then it says here in verse 8, And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house and wash thy feet. Go home, Uriah. You're probably dirty and dusty. You've been out with, with the men at the battle for a little while. Go home, wash your feet, clean up. Um, put, some, put your nice PJs on that have just come out of the dryer. Get comfortable at home. Sit on your couch. Go home and uh, wash your feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house and there followed with him a mess of meat from the king. You think of the mess hall in the navy or in the army, they go to the mess hall, uh, that's the food. He says, so the king, he sent, well, he sent him a feast of the king's table, food and wine and cheeses and whatever else. And he sends that home with Uriah because he has the intention that Uriah in his mind, go home, he's going to get comfortable, he's going to put on his slippers, he's going to have a wonderful meal, his wife who has hasn't seen for a while. He's going to have uh, marriage relationships with his uh, with his wife, and uh, then uh, when when Bathsheba is said that she's pregnant, they'll just say, "Well, Uriah was just home recently, and uh, he I saw him at home, and he had that particular evening, couple of nights there with his wife, no doubt." And uh, so he says that's the plan in the king. Um, but it says in verse nine that Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of the Lord. And went not down to his house. He didn't, he didn't go home. He went home, uh, but he didn't sleep home. He slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants. Verse 10 says, And when they had told David, uh, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Haven't you come from a long way? You haven't been home for a while? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel... And Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest and as thy soul livest, I will not do this thing. The man had some loyalty to the men. He had, he had some character in him to say, no, right now is not really a time for me to be goofing off or just to be relaxing, really, not goofing off, but relaxing uh, and be enjoying life. There's, there's some very serious matters that are being attended to and I need to keep myself in tip-top shape and I need to stay with the men and not go home to my wife and I need to uh, remain sharp and focused because I'm still on duty. I may be back in the city, but I'm still on duty. And uh, that's what he's saying to David. And the man had character there. And Uriah said unto David, the ark, um, how will I do this? Verse 12, and David said to Uriah, tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow, stayed a little bit longer, extended it out. And when, David call, and when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him and he made him drunk. David made Uriah drunk, gave him wine until he was drunk. And at even in the evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house, even drunk, which David tried to get him drunk so that he would lower his morals and that he would then go home to his wife. And, uh, but even drunk, uh, Uriah had more character than David drunk than David had sober. That's the kind of man who Uriah is here. And he's still even drunk. He's like, no, I'm staying here. I'm still on duty. And he wrote, verse 14, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab. Things weren't quite going the way that David had intended them to go. So David had, comes up with plan C. And he writes a letter to Joab and sends it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. This is an amazing story. Just the character of Uriah. He didn't peek. He didn't look at those instructions that were, that were written out by King David, sealed by the king's signet. He was David knew that he could trust Uriah with the message carried back. And Uriah took his own death notice back to Joab. And uh, when Joab read it, 
He uh, understood exactly what David was saying. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah under a place where he knew that the valiant men were. He knew in the battle, this over here is where the valiant men of, of Ramah are. And he put them towards there. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab. And there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger saying, When thou hast made an end of telling the matters of the war unto the king, and if so be that the king's wrath arise, and he say unto thee, Wherefore approacheth ye so nigh, so near unto the city when ye did fight? Knew ye not that they would shoot from the wall? So obviously they were not normally going that close to the wall. Right, there, uh, and he gives the illustration here. Who smote Abimelech, the son of uh, uh, Jerubasheth, did not a woman cast a piece of millstone upon him from the wall that he died in Thebes? Thebes? Why went ye nigh the wall? Then say thou, he says, just in case this is what David says, obviously it's not the tactic to go near the wall. They're going to throw rocks at you. Or they're going to throw, shoot arrows at you. And he says, but that's what happened. That's how Uriah died. Um, and he says, if he does ask this, then say, thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and showed David all that Joab uh, had sent him for. And the messenger said unto David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were upon them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon thy servants, and some of the king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. And then David said unto the horsemen, unto the messengers, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee. For the sword devoureth one as well as another. Make the battle more strong against the city and overthrow it and encourage him thou. And he just simply just brushes it off like, oh well, just the way sometimes the sword cuts this way and sometimes it cuts this way. Sometimes we get them and sometimes they get some of our men. You know, that's just war. And he just was completely just like, ah, oh well, that's just the way it is. Um, but of course, that was the condition and the state of David at this particular time. And that's what I want to highlight to you tonight is just the condition of David's heart and, and how he treated those around him during this particular time. Because here you have in this chapter, you have him treating Uriah with such disgust. You have him treating Joab. You have him treating um, the deaths of not just Joab. Others died with Joab. There were more than just Joab. And his heart, instead of mourning, and instead of being sorrowful, instead of being lamenting, um, and he, he was known to lament David. He lamented greatly when Saul was killed. He lamented greatly when Jonathan was killed. He lamented later on greatly when Absalom dies. And he was a man to lament over deaths of those around him. But here Uzziah dies, and here other men die, and it's like he is completely unfazed by it and it's just completely callous and cold and he's just like, ah, that's just the way it goes. Sometimes you'll win, sometimes you'll lose. Move on, encourage him. All right, let's go on. That's how his heart is. He's callous and cold at this moment, which is not normal for David. He is an emotional man, is he not? If you read the Psalms, he is emotional. He is a man who has great passion for God and he has a great passion in life and writes the songs. He's an emotional guy and here he is completely devoid of emotion. Emotionless, just, eh, oh well, on we go. So just go encourage him that he keeps fighting. Verse 26, And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house and she became his wife and bare him a son and the thing... But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So if you're going to take Uriah, you're going to kill Uriah, you're going to take Bathsheba, she's going to go full term in this pregnancy, nine months, and then a son is born. We're talking almost a year here has taken place from when it took place to the time that Nathan comes on the scene. Nathan comes on the scene um, after the child is born and who knows how long. Let's say the child, just for round numbers and just for round figures, let's say the child is three months of age by the time Nathan shows up and the child is alive because he dies seven days later after Nathan visits, all right? So let's just say three months. 
And it says in chapter 12, when the Lord sent unto Nathan, unto da- and the Lord sent Nathan the prophet unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, um, there were two men, and this is like one of the greatest direct preaching or direct ways of handling a situation, just a wonderfully wise way of handling a situation. And he came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children, and it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup, lay on his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. I mean, love this little ewe lamb. And there came a traveller unto a rich unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger, now the emotions are back, aren't they? This is the David we know. He's got some, some, some righteous zeal in him all of a sudden. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. <laughs> it's strong. Strong on David's behalf. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Man, I'd just love to be in that room to see how that went down. Man, how the tone changed. Lickety split is the word they use in America. Super fast. Lickety split. The the tone in that room changed from uh, from David's anger towards someone else and realized that the bony old finger of that prophet was pointing at him saying, thou art the man. And not like they, the word is so used today uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst the youth of our generation. You the man, and not at all what he means here. Thou art the man. You're the one guilty. You're the rich man in this story. You're the one who has taken, um, this, uh, taken the lamb. You're the one. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel. I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee the, thy master's house, thy master's wives, I, uh, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if thou had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Whatever you want, I would have given you things. And yet you stole another man's wife and killed the man and had others killed as a result of this. Just horrendous. And you couldn't care less. You're just hard. <clears throat> Look at chapter, verse number 26 though. That takes place probably 12 months after, probably 12 months I would say, after the initial event. 12 months goes by. Verse number 26, And Joab fought against Rabah. That's the city that we heard in chapter 11. Rabah is of Ammonites. He, that's where Uzziah died fighting that battle. And he got, so we returned back to that fight. And Joab fought against Rabah and of the children of Ammon and took the royal city. And Joab sent messengers to David and said, why? Because David's not there, is he? He's still not being a king. He's still not being his duty. He's still not out leading the army and out there with the men. And so he has to be called by Joab. And Joab sends messengers to David and says, Get down here, we're about to win. And he says, I have fought against Rabah and I have taken the city of waters. Now therefore gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. And David gathered all the people together and went to Rabah and fought against it and took it. So at the very end of that battle, David shows up. He wins it and then so that he gets the claim because he's still the king. So Joab does the right thing. um, And David finally shows up on the scene right at the very end. They win that last little bit of the battle. And verse 30 says, He took the king's crown from off his head, weighed thereof. The weight thereof was a talent of gold of the precious stones, and it was set on David's head. And he brought forth the spoil of the city in great abundance. And he brought forth the people that were therein, and put them under saws, and under harrows of iron, and under axes of iron, and made them pass through the brick kiln. And thus did he unto all the cities of the children of Ammon. So David and all the people returned unto Jerusalem. It's horrendous what David does here. And it's some, there's two ways of looking at this. There's one way to say he put them under tribute. Then he put them under, he made them hewers of wood. He made them ax, under axes and they were chopping down trees and they were making bricks like Egyptians. 
But the other way to look at this, and First Chronicles and uh, sort of uh, will help us out with this, that when it says that he made them pass through the brick kiln, some would say that the Ammonites, the God of the Ammonites, does anybody know who the God of the Ammonites was? Think of passing through stuff. Molech. Yes, the God of the Ammonites. And they would have the children pass through the fires unto Ammon, Ammonites, unto Molech. Um, and some have said that passing through the, and he made them pass through the brick kiln, sort of did to them what they were doing to their, their children and different things that they were doing and had them pass through the fire as to kill them in that way is what it seems, rather than just making them to be Hebrew slaves like they were and make bricks. But actually it would seem that he killed them uh, by these different measures. First Chronicles, look over at First Chronicles for the same story from a different perspective. First Chronicles chapter number 20 first chronicles chapter number 20 verse number 1 it says and it came to pass after that year was expired at the time that kings go out to battle well, that sounds familiar. That connects us up to the same place that we are in 2 Samuel chapter number 11. The time that kings go forth to battle. Joab led forth the power of the army and wasted the country of the children of Ammon and came and besieged Rabah. So they're destroying the Ammonites at this particular season and they're winning back the land and they're defeating the Ammonites and they besieged Rabah. We're talking about the same time that the sin takes place. Joab is out doing this. David at this particular time, we learn from 2 Samuel, he's back committing adultery with Bathsheba. Um, but David tarried at Jerusalem and Joab smote Rabah and destroyed it. And David took the crown off the king from off his head, found it to weigh a talent of gold and there were precious stones in it and it was set upon David's head and he brought also exceeding much spoil out of the city. And he brought out the people that were in it and cut them with saws. He didn't just, he didn't put them to the saws as in to make them hewers of wood. It says that he cut them with saws. He cut them with saws and with harrows of iron and with axes. Even so dealt David with all the cities of the children of Ammon and David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. So this season that he was defeating the Ammonites and the city of Rabah particularly is the same year in that same season that is between Bathsheba is with child and she is um, going that nine month term and Nathan it would seem by the chronology of the events Nathan hasn't yet come to David and pointed the finger at him and said thou art the man. And so for 12 months, David is living with the sin that he tried to cover. He's trying to cover it up in his own life. He's deceived, he's killed Uriah, he's committed adultery, he's got a child now and probably no doubt there are some people that there are whispers going on around the palace and around Jerusalem that Uriah was killed, maybe it was getting out that Uriah was actually killed by David and that David came, that when Uriah came back, the people would testify. He never went home to his wife. And there were those that would witness these things. And then he was killed and Bathsheba is with child. And there's some whispers saying, well, we saw her at the temple, at the, at the palace. We saw these events take place. And so there's probably whisperings taking place as well. Um, and there's different things that are happening. And there's just the gossip that's going around and the talk of the town and some things that are not yet, uh, it's like the, the king, um, Mohammed bin Salman. I don't know what his name is. You know the guy in uh, Crown Prince there in Saudi Arabia? And they had the, uh, the journalist killed. And the guy that went to the Turkish, he went to the Turkish embassy. Um, and he went to the Saudi Arabian embassy, whatever that guy's name was. Qureshi or Kadeshi or whatever his name was. Um, and the journalist, couple of, 2018, went into the Saudi Arabian embassy. And they had a hit squad go in. And they killed him, dismembered him, and never found the body from where, where he was taken. Um, and the CIA tracked it, and they went it all back. And basically, it came back to the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And he's the one that didn't like what this journalist was writing about him. And over a series of years, and he had to flee, and he went to Washington. Um, and the leaks and all the, the tappings and all the different wires that they had got came back and said it was the crown prince. The crown prince 
ordered the hit. And he went on during before these findings came out and Biden released these CIA investigations onto the Crown Prince. Um, before that, the Crown Prince went on to 60 Minutes in the United States and the, the lady that was interviewing him said, did you order the hit on whatever? Are you responsible for his death? And she, and he looks face at her and says, no. No, that you you don't. You, that's not what the events, how things took place, and all the evidence has come out since to say that that's not true. So you can understand that things are said before the evidence truly comes out, and before the truth is known, there are whispers that are taking place about the events that have, that are happening. And so, no doubt, in those twelve months, David's sin is maybe being talked about, and he's hoping it's not coming out. He's already got the guilt of knowing that he murdered Uriah. He already knows that he's committed adultery. That child is not Uriah's. He knows it's his all of these things are taking place now he's married her and he has the guilt he's a man who fears God he has the guilt of all of this sin that's in his life that he has brought about from his idleness and from not him not doing what he ought to do and it's compounded to get it's just this snowball effect it's getting worse it's getting worse to the place no doubt during those 12 months if you look at what it seems to be happening He doesn't have the joy of the Lord. In fact, do you want to know what the psalm number is? Is his repentant psalm? It's Psalm 51. Do you know what one of the very things he says in Psalm 51? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Because you know what sin does? It takes away your joy. Where once a person was joyful, once a person was happy, once a person was enjoying life, now sin has entered in and it's the joy is gone and now their whole disposition, their whole attitude, their whole demeanor changes and now there's a harshness to them where once they were emotional people, now they're cold and callous. And once they had a great heart and a fervor for people, now they don't like these people. And you're thinking, what's going on here? What's happening? What's the change in David's life over these 12 months? In David's life, the change is there was a root of sin that had never yet been dealt with. And he was still trying to cover it up. And it wasn't until the preacher got up, pointed his finger at him and says, you've got sin here and you know it and God knows it and you need to get this right, that David breaks and says, you know what? I have sinned against God. I have sinned against my maker. I have sinned. And as he gets right with God, the joy of his life comes back. And during that time, he is just a miserable person to be around. He's hard. He's hard on probably everyone. He's hard on Joab and he's hard on his men and he's probably hard on his wives. He's hard to be around in the palace. He's hard. I mean, even the enemies, even the enemies receive no mercy. Cut them in half. Send them through them. Send them through the fires like they like the fires. They think their God's going to bring. They think the, their God is welcoming with their outreached arms and the fire. Send them through the fire themselves. Then probably is the attitude of David during this time. Put them under sores. Cut them up like they've cut up our people. No mercy there. It's just there's a harshness to him. There's a hardness to him. And you think, what's going on? And people might not know what's going on around him, but they acknowledge, you know, these last 12 months, David hasn't been the David that we knew. In fact, if you went back about two years previous or even 12 months previous before the sin and uh, and you went back, you'd say, man, David is just such a merciful person. In fact, you know one of the very last things he does in recorded before he sins with Bathsheba? It's one of the pinnacles of his... Uh, of his reign it's when he goes to Mephibosheth and he says is there not anyone of the house of Saul in which I can show mercy to is there no one that I can show mercy to the guy that wanted to kill him he has such a heart for God and such a heart and he's such he's so walking with God that he wants to find his enemy from a from previous and he just wants to show mercy upon someone in his house and they said oh there's this limp there's this lame guy that is of the son of Saul of the son of Jonathan uh, and he's down in Lodibar and his name is Mephibosheth and he says bring him bring him up put him at my table I'll look after him and I'll take care of him. It's a wonderful picture of the grace of God to us fallen sinners. Though undeserving, yet we are made to sit at the king's table. And we are the Mephibosheths in that case. And David is acting in a way that is much like God himself. 
and then not a chapter or two later, he's no longer the merciful man that we have grown to know. He's now the callous, cold, unmerciful, very different person. And say, so what is the difference? And if you sat down with a psychologist, they'd say, this is, this is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from the times that you were running from Saul. And uh, you probably need some medication. And no doubt this is all the trauma that's coming out from all your previous times. And tell me about that Goliath. That you, how tall was he? And did you say you? And you cut his head off. And no doubt that would have been traumatic. When you cut his head off and to have him stand before you. All the trauma. The lion and the bear trauma. I'm sure trauma. And this is just difficult. No doubt this year in your life, this midlife crisis has to do with all the trauma that you've faced in your life. And people wanted to kill you. It's the trauma that's coming out, no doubt. But was that really the truth? No, that year wasn't a midlife crisis because of trauma from his childhood. It's from the sin of his adulthood. And it was the sin that had changed him. It was the sin that made him unmerciful. It was the sin that changed his spirit and his heart. And it wasn't until he got right with God that his spirit came back and God restored to him the joy of his salvation. And you might be here tonight... And you may not have committed murder or had a hit go out on someone or even committed adultery or whatever the things that David has done. But you know what? Rhiannon and I have noticed this in our kids' lives, and maybe you have too, that oftentimes when they're the hardest to deal with, that there's unrepentant sin in their life and they're doing things that they ought not be doing. And that's probably not just true for kids because it's true here for an adult, King David, that sometimes the reason of the change in behavior, the reason for the lack of mercy, the reason for the callousness, the reason for the, for the grumpiness, the reason for this, this change of attitudes for the worse actually has to do with known unrepentant sin. And the longer we harbor it, the, the, the less we are merciful, which is what David did. He was not, not merciful to Uriah. The, that blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, which is the, which is the opposite. And Jesus says this, um, blessed are the merciful, or, um, how does he say it? Now I can't remember the verse. Um, basically, if you don't forgive someone else's sins, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you, you of your sins. That you can't harbor the sin in your life and have joy and be merciful, and be gracious, and be good with God, that it tracks back to some sin in the life that is not dealt with. And it's not until that sin, whatever it is, is dealt with, that the spirit and the heart changes. And once that sin is dealt with from the very beginning, then it's, as David testifies, man, God has restored to me the joy of my salvation. And there are Psalms that are written after this period of time in his life that are wonderful psalms and give God wonderful glory and his emotions and his joy and the love for God comes back. Yes, there are consequences for his sins and the sword never leaves his house and Absalom and all of the, and all the debacle and the, all those things that happened in his life and um, Amnon and Tamar and just the mess of his life as a result of his sin. Yes, but David is a personal walk with God it wasn't until he got right with God that his heart changed and got right. And David lacked mercy here towards all those around him and it wasn't again because of his childhood or whatever else you could pin it on. The pinning was the finger of Nathan who says, I'll tell you where this problem is. It's this sin that you have tried to cover up and you're trying to hide and you, rem you are still trying to act as if it never happened and hoping that no one else finds out. But you know about it and God knows about it. And he says, you just need to get it right. Repent of it. Deal with this. This is really the issue. And David, once dealt with, changed. His whole demeanor changed. As a result, it was the sin that was causing the problem. Would you bow your heads and your hearts before God?